Okay, welcome back kids. Today we're going to continue with this section 4.5 all about thermal energy and heat. But today is definitely numbers, units, equations, calculations. It is quantitative. So let's get started. So as thermal energy enters or leaves an object, the object's temperature can increase or decrease. You probably experienced this. Um, you know, if you're going to make a cup of tea or something, you put tea into the kettle and you turn on the uh, stove and all of a sudden the temperature of the water increases. And then you made your tea, but maybe it's too hot. So you put an ice cube in it and the temperature of the water can drop. Okay, so temperatures uh, changes as you add or remove thermal energy. Well, how much will that temperature change by? So let's find out. The amount of temperature change, which we call delta T, depends on a few things. One of the things it depends on is the amount of thermal energy heat that's gained or lost. And we call that Q. The more heat that's gained or lost, the greater the temperature change. If you leave the kettle on the stove only for a short amount of time, it's not going to give as much energy from the stove to the water that's in the kettle. You won't get as much of a temperature change. If you leave it on longer, more energy is going to be exchanged from the stove to the water in the kettle, and you'll get a larger temperature change. So that's the first thing we have to realize. If you put more energy in or take more energy out, you'll have a possibility of a greater temperature change. Next, the mass of the object. The more massive an object requires more heat for temperature change. Are you making one cup of tea or are you making tea for the whole school? Well, that's kind of an exaggeration. Let's say tea for five people. If you're making tea for five people, you need more water. More water means there's more mass. If you want to bring that up to the proper temperature to make a nice cup of tea since you are trying to increase the temperature of a more massive amount of water, there's more mo water there, you're going to need a lot more energy, thermal energy. You need more heat to raise the temperature of that amount of water to a proper temperature for making tea. So the more massive objects require more heat for temperature change. Next, the type of material gaining or losing, losing thermal energy. Are you heating up water? Are you heating up a brick? Are you heating up a piece of steel? What are you heating up? Because that's going to affect uh, how much energy is needed to change the temperature of that material. So the type of material gaining or losing thermal energy. This is quantified in a value called C. And it has a name. It is called the specific heat capacity of a substance. It is a property of a substance, just like density is a property of a substance or color is a property of a substance. Each material, each substance has its own specific heat capacity, its own specific heat capacity. It is the amount of heat needed to change the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So if you want to increase or decrease the temperature of a material, not just any amount of material, but one kilogram of that material, you're talking about the specific heat capacity of that substance. All right, it's very specific to changing one kilogram of that substance by a temperature change of one degree Celsius. Very specific to that. So let's see what we have here. A couple of examples. They're in your textbook. You can look them up. I've just got two of them here. The specific heat capacity of water is 4,180 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So if you take a look at the units, it's telling you that if you want to change the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius, you're going to need to either add or remove 4,180 joules of energy, depending if you want to heat up the water or cool down the water. 
Here's another one. C iron, the specific heat capacity of iron is equal to 450 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So if you want to heat up by one degree Celsius, a one kilogram sample of iron, you need 450 joules of heat energy to be pumped into it. You want to decrease by one degree Celsius the one kilogram sample of iron, you're going to need to remove 450 joules of energy from heat energy from that sample of iron. So this can all be wrapped up into an equation. You want to find out how much temperature change you're going to have? It equals how much energy, thermal energy, heat is either added or removed divided by how much mass of that sample you have and the specific heat capacity of that sample. Are you heating up water? Are you heating up iron? What are you heating up? Or you can write it like this, because remember what delta means. Delta temperature is temperature final minus temperature initial. So you can write it like that as well. Usually in most textbooks, you won't see it written like this. You'll see this equation written like this. Q is equal to MC delta T or Q is equal to MC bracket temperature final minus temperature initial. All right, but I like teaching it this way. I think it makes more sense to me. I could be wrong. I don't know. Okay, here's an example. A 200, excuse me, a 2.5 kilogram piece of iron initially at 41 degrees Celsius loses, loses 5,000 joules of heat. What is the new temperature of the iron? Well, you know what? Let's change that. I don't want to lose it. Let, let's change this to gains. I just changed my mind. Let's do that. A 2.5 kilogram piece of iron initially at 41 degrees Celsius gains, gains 5,000 joules of heat. What is the new temperature of the iron? Okay, well, here is the first equation that we need to write right there. I'm using this because it says, what is the new temperature of the iron? So when it says, what is the new temperature of the iron? What we're really calculating is temperature final. So that's why I went with this version of the equation. So I want to solve for temperature final. Okay. So in order to solve for temperature final, I need to isolate this variable right here. I need to have it all by itself. So I'm going to bring the temperature initial over to the other side and now that negative turns into a positive. There you have it. So here is the new equation, nice and tidy. The quantity that we're solving for has been isolated for on the left hand side. So we can start to plug in numbers and we do. So here is the heat gain. Remember I changed it to gain. So that's 5,000 joules. If I had left it as lost, we would have had to put a negative sign in there because heat lost is negative, but I'm going to keep it as gain. It's our first example. Let's keep it simple. All right. So definitely no negative sign because the heat is being gained by the piece of iron. Put in the mass, 2.5 kilograms, put in the specific heat capacity, 450 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And now I do some unit canceling. The joule from here cancels the joule from here. The kilogram from here cancels the kilogram from here. And we do our calculation here and we're left with that this expression turns into 4.4 degrees Celsius plus the 41 degrees Celsius we already had in the iron for a final temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. So if you need to slow down the video to go through the math or pause it, take your time, just pause it. Okay. It would be like us in class and you say, sir, slow down. I know you love science and you're getting all excited. Just slow down. So just pause it. All right. Wouldn't it be great if we had a pause button in school and you could push the pause button and I would just stop and freeze and then start up again when you wanted to go. That'd be kind of neat. Anyways, you have the ability to do that here. Okay. The next main idea in this part of the uh, section is about heat exchange. If you got a warm object and a cool object here, they're touching, then 
heat will transfer from the warm to the cold. So that's the first thing we have to realize. There's a direction to this. Heat is transferred from a warm object to a cool object. And the net heat transfer occurs until a common final temperature is reached. So there's definitely going to be a net flow of thermal energy, of heat, from warm to cool until a common final temperature is reached. They both settle on a new final temperature. You may remember that from some of the simulations that I had available uh, to you in the uh, previous lesson. All right. So that's still pretty qualitative. Let's take a look at trying to find an equation from this. And the equation all comes from something you've already learned, the law of conservation of energy. All right. So it says the amount of heat loss, remember heat's a type of energy. So the amount of heat loss by the warm object has to equal the negative of the amount of heat gained by the cool object. Let me explain to you why we have a negative sign there. Let me explain to you why we have a negative sign there. So if the warm object loses 100 joules of thermal energy, 100 joules, it's a loss of energy. I need to put a negative sign in there to say, look, we're losing energy here. If an object gains 100 joules of thermal energy, 100 joules heat, okay, I have to put in a positive sign there because there's been a gain. Well, the only way I can make an equal sign to be viable in here, to be true in here, the only way a negative can equal a positive is if I put the negative sign in there. That's the only way you'll get both sides to be equal because the change here is negative. The change here is positive. To make them equal, I put the negative sign in front. And that leads us to our next equation, which is the amount of heat lost by an object undergoing heat transfer is equal to negative the amount of heat gained by the other object involved in the heat transfer. Whatever is lost by one object is gained by the other. And then what we do is we remember what this equation is, Q is the mass of the warm object times the specific heat capacity of the warm object times the temperature change the warm object underwent equals negative sign. The mass of the cool object multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the cool object multiplied by the temperature change that the cool object underwent. So I've just written out the equations for Q. That's all I've done here. Next, I'm going to expand this delta. We all remember what delta means, change in. So the mass stays the same. The specific heat capacity stays the same, right? That stays the same. But now delta, I'm going to expand that. Delta is temperature final minus temperature initial. But it's the temperature initial for the warm object. Equals minus mass stays the same. Specific heat capacity stays the same. Temperature final minus temperature initial for the cool object. You may have noticed I didn't put temperature final warm, temperature final cool. I didn't do that because if you were paying attention beforehand, temperature final is common for both. They both reach a common final temperature. I don't need to put a C here or a W here. It's the same amount. So we just leave it like that. All right, let's try an example. A 200 gram so I'm going to convert it to 0.2 kilograms because we have to use kilograms. Piece of iron at 350 degrees Celsius is submerged in a 300 gram, mm, nope, 0.3 kilogram, got to convert it, we use kilograms, of water at 10 degrees Celsius. So picture this, you've got this hot piece of metal, wow, 350 degrees Celsius, and you're going to dump it, submerge it into some water at 10 degrees Celsius to cool it down. That's what we're doing. And we want to find what the final temperature, the common final temperature will be once the uh, process has occurred. Well, where do we start? Well, let's see here. We have from the law of conservation of energy that whatever heat is lost this has to equal negative of whatever heat is gained. Then we expand it just like we did a few moments ago. So we expand it out. When we take advantage of what delta means, 
right? What does delta mean? We keep that in a bracket. We keep that in a bracket, remembering that they're going to have a common final temperature. That's why there's no extra subscript here. It's just TF, final temperature. TF, final temperature is going to be common to both the iron and the water. Next, we plug in the numbers. The mass, the specific heat capacity, the initial temperature. The mass, the specific heat capacity, the initial temperature. If you need to pause the video to see what I've substituted in, please do so. Slow it down and see how I've made the substitution. Next, what are we going to do next? Well, we're going to multiply. We're going to multiply the 0.2 kilograms times the 450 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, and we get 90 joules per degree Celsius. You notice the kilogram canceled out here. This bracket stays the same, equal. Don't forget to bring the negative sign down. Very common mistake. Then we're going to multiply the 0 0.30 kilograms times the 4,180 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Once again, the kilogram cancels out. Take a look at that. It's gone. And we're left with joules per kilogram, joules per degree Celsius. I beg your pardon. And when you do the multiplying, it's 1,254. The bracket remains the same. The bracket remains the same. What are we going to do next? We're going to divide both sides by this 90 joules per uh, degree Celsius. So if I divide this side by 90 joules per degree Celsius, it cancels out. Leaves us with a 1 that we don't write down. And we're just left with the bracket. Equals, now I'm going to divide this 1254 joules per degree Celsius. I'm going to divide it by 90 joules per degree Celsius. I'm left with, don't forget to bring the negative sign down, 13 0.93 and the joules per degree Celsius cancels with the joules per degree Celsius so there's no unit here the units are exactly the same they cancel out and we're left with what we have in the bracket next we're going to remove the brackets don't need it here it's not being multiplied by anything really well there's a one there okay so we can remove the bracket now I'm going to do some distributive multiplication so I'm going to bring in the 13.93 into the the negative 13.93 into the temperature final I'm going to multiply that in so I get negative 13.93 temperature final I'm now going to multiply the negative 13.93. I'm going to bring it into the negative 10 degrees Celsius distributive multiplication, and I get plus 139.3 degrees Celsius. That's what we've done right here. Next, I'm going to collect like terms. On the left-hand side, because we eventually want to solve for TF, on the left-hand side, I'm going to bring together all the TFs. I'm collecting like terms. So this negative 13.93 TF comes over to the other side, becomes positive. On this side, the right-hand side, I'm going to collect all the temperatures. So I already have a 139.3 degrees Celsius. That remains. But I'm going to bring this negative 350 degrees Celsius. I'm going to bring it over to the other side. Now it's positive. So 1 TF plus 13.93 TFs gives me 14.93 TFs. I add these two temperatures together. I get 489.3 degrees Celsius. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 14.93. And bingo, bango, I have the common final temperature of 33 degrees Celsius. That's the final temperature for the water and the final temperature for the iron. Okay, so I've uh, given you some examples here. Uh, check the website for the homework that I left. Try it. And good luck, everybody. Keep working hard. I'm really proud of you and what you're doing. Check in every day. Communicate with your friends. We all learn better when we learn together. I know you kids know how to communicate with texting and email and, and slip, slap chat and tic-tac-toe and all those things you kids communicate with. So keep doing that. Keep learning together. And as always, if you have any questions, I've created discussion threads that you can ask me questions in. I'll be more than happy to help you out with these questions so you understand. Okay, you guys take care. Bye-bye.